Good morning. So, we start with the case. So, it's a typical case, uh, what we get in uh, acute pancreatitis, you know. The 48 year old obese man with history of alcoholism, presented with history of epigastric pain and vomiting for last two days. He also was having shortness of breath for past six hours. And he has a history of alcohol use or abuse, whatever you call it, uh, for last four, hour, four years. On, a, on admission to the ER, he had a heart rate of 110, BP was hypotensive, tachypneic, temperature of 38.6 degrees Celsius, SPO of 86% on room air. And he, when you examine the abdomen, abdomen was distended with a diffusely tender uh, tenderness and bowel sound was absent. So this is the usual scenario in pancreatitis. Do you agree? And but how do you diagnose it? So you all know there are uh, two of these three criteria has to be fulfilled. Classically, with a classical abdominal pain, a pain radiating to the back and uh, which is relieved by bending forward and um, uh, associated with a rise in the serum amylase or serum lipase by more than three times of the upper limit of normal that establishes the diagnosis of acute pancreatitis. In case we fail to diagnose it, and but we have a very strong suspicion of uh, pancreatitis or we are unable to rule out other plausible causes of acute abdominal pain in the upper abdomen like perforation peritonitis, we can go ahead with the imaging like CT, CCT, contrast CT abdomen or some MRI less commonly or ultrasound, right? So, which one? Amylase or lipase? <laughs> lipase. Why lipase? Why not amylase? The advantage of amylase is it is cheap. It is easily available everywhere, right? And it rises within few hours and within three to five days it goes down to the normal. So problem is if a patient comes to us after 72 hours, what happens? The lipase may be falsely negative. In those cases, probably lipase will, uh, I mean, amylase is falsely negative. But in those cases, probably lipase has got an advantage over the amylase. Another problem with amylase is its sensitivity is not very good. Even in 20, up to 20 percent of the patients, amylase may not be positive. Particularly if the patient has got a history of alcoholism, alcoholic pancreatitis, like the case we discussed, or a patient with hypertriglyceridemia can have a normal amylase level. And there are certain cases where amylase is falsely elevated. For example, conditions like macroamylasemia, where amylases are clotted together, GFR is decreased, patients with renal insufficiency, certain problems like diabetic ketoacidosis or some problems with the salivary gland, salivary gland produces salivary amylase, you know, or some abdominal diseases can have a falsely positive serum amylase. So here comes the role of lipase. Lipase elevated starts elevating in 4 to 8 hours time. There is no need of writing these things, you know. These all will be uploaded in the Facebook, you know. So you can uh, trace, track it down. Uh, and normalizes, normalizes within 7 to 14 days. So it remains in the blood for a longer period of time. It is more specific than amylase. It is more sensitive as we discussed after 40 to 72 hours when amylase is actually going down, right? Is there any necessity for sending both? Answer is no. There is no need of sending. It doesn't improve the sense of accuracy of diagnosis. So send only one of them. So my suggestion is if you are not suspecting alcoholic pancreatitis, if you are not suspecting uh, hypertriglyceridemia as a cause of pancreatitis, and patient is well within 48 to 72 hours, patient is not having any renal insufficiency, send light amylase because it is cheap and it is easily available. If these cases are not fulfilled, then send lipase. But there is at least one guideline which suggests that if lipase is available, it is preferred over amylase. That was published way back in 2005. Then comes the etiology. There are many causes of uh, pancreatitis, but mostly there are two important causes. One is alcoholic and another is uh, gallstone. And which one is more important depends upon the level of alcoholism in that particular society, you know. 
some society has a lot of uh, alcoholism is prevalent then alcohol, alcohol becomes the more important thing but otherwise by and large across the country across the world gallstone is probably the most common cause of pancreatitis and more importantly gallstone pancreatitis treatment is slightly different from other causes of pancreatitis okay so we when do you suspect gallstone pancreatitis when there is a very high ast sgot and sgpt and the pain onset of pain is maximum at the onset itself then you should suspect biliary pancreatitis and we have to establish the diagnosis by mrcp or eus and definitely by an ultrasound okay alcoholic you can identify from history itself hypertriglyceridemia though not common but again it has got a specific treatment you have to do go for plasma pheresis or plasma exchange and other things so you have to you should diagnose it early to send the triglyceride level at the time of admission to the hospital if you can't send in the first 24 hours please send it only at the time of discharge if the triglyceride level is more than 1000 mg per deciliter suspect hypertriglyceridemia as the cause of pancreatitis important thing is to remember the drugs many drugs but particularly i would like to emphasize on two drugs one is sodium valproate which is very commonly used and a drug called azathioprine again not very un uncommonly used particularly in rheumatology practice so these are relatively common causes of drug induced acute pancreatitis another important thing is ercp ercp you know ercp per second which is used for pancreatitis and per second produce pancreatitis and up to 5 to 10% of the patients who undergoes ERCP can have pancreatitis, right? And there is a beautiful study published in NEGM back in 2012, where if you give per rectal indomethacin just after the ERCP, in high risk patient, there is a significant decrease in the incidences of um, uh, ERCP induced pancreatitis. There are other causes too. What is the role of ultrasound? Ultrasound is not a very great modality for diagnosing pancreatitis as such because of the bowel gas. But ultrasound is a must for every patient because 95% sensitivity for picking up gallstone pancreatitis, gallstone. It can also identify evidences of cholecystitis. It can identify uh, peri peri-gallbladder edema, pericholecystic fluid, but it is insensitive in picking up stone, cholecystitis, stone in the bile duct, right? So ultrasound is mandatory, not for establishing diagnosis, but for establishing the etiology. What is the role of CT scan? We have discussed early, if you have a doubt regarding the diagnosis, CT scan is mandatory. Otherwise, we do CT scan and CT scan is advised only in patients whose symptoms are not getting subsidized after 48 to 72 hours. Patients who are doing good, then there is no need of doing CT scan. But after 48 to 72 hours, patient is still symptomatic. Then do a CT scan to rule out local complications, particularly necrosis, right? Third is in later part, when you are suspecting infection, pancreatic necrosis and infected pancreatic necrosis, do a CT or do a ultrasound to, to get a CT guided FNA sample. And fourth is any deterioration in the initial improvement after initial improvement if the patient again deteriorates, you are suspecting some local complications or some infection, again you do a CT scan. So there are four indications for CT scan. Okay. CT also can tell us about the severity of the pancreatitis. Patient is, uh, has come to you with history of pain abdomen and a classical amylase and lipase elevated and after, within 72 hours it settles down, probably it's not a severe pancreatitis, right? But only when the still patient is in pain or there are some criteria which is being fulfilled, these patients actually are severe pancreatitis and CT can easily pick it up. There is a uh, very difficult to remember all those things, you know. It is, I, I have just copied it. You also can copy it from anywhere. You know, there, there is something called severity grading, Balthazar score, you know, 1990, back in 1990. I don't remember them. So, only thing is that what is more important for us is you should see a patient who has got a you know, 
score of more than 7 they are classified as severe pancreatitis as per this classification and if you can see only a patient who has got necrosis can fulfill the criteria of score of 7 the patient who are not having evidence of necrosis will not be a severe pancreatitis what is the role of MRI one MRI when the CT is not can't be done because of many reasons one reason is renal failure or for identifying gold stone particularly modality called MRCP what is MRCP magnetic resonance cholangiopancreatography this is a gold standard for picking up uh, um, CBD stone with a 95 to 97 percent sensitivity right so how do you classify this is important so acute pancreatitis is classified into three groups this is the uh, uh, what do you what do you call Atlanta modified Atlanta classification it came in 2013 actually it came in 2012 but it was published in 2013 so modified Atlanta score says if the patient has got any no evidence of organ failure then the or there is no local complications classify them into mild acute pancreatitis if the patient has got local complications or there is a transient organ failure means organ failure which is lasting for less than 48 hours they are called moderately severe acute pancreatitis here the mortality risk is less than 2 percent acute mild cases here the mortality risk is less than 5 percent but if the patient develops persistent organ failure lasting for more than 48 hours it becomes severe acute pancreatitis and mortality is 15 to 20 percent so you can see 2 percent 5 percent 15 to 20 percent that is another classification which uh, adds one more thing called critical pancreatitis right that involves a persistent organ failure plus evidence of pancreatic necrotic infection there the mortality becomes more than 30 percent up to that even of 60 percent this classification is important for the for the purpose of exams now how do you define the organ failure organ failure is defined as the failure of any of the organ systems respiratory cardiovascular or renal or exacerbation of the pre-existing illness like coid chf or chronic liver disease and these are classified according to the modified Marshall Marshall score so you remember pf ratio 200 se kam hai less than 200 patient have got a creatinine of more than 1.8 milligram per deciliter or having a hypotension after fluid resuscitation they are having organ failure if this organ failure lasts for more than 48 hours then we call it severe acute pancreatitis right now what are the lo local complications this particular guideline define these local complications acute peripancreatic fluid collection pancreatic cirrhosis acute necrotic collection and walled off necrosis depending upon whether the collection is having a necrosis inside the pancreas or is there any fluid collection outside the pancreas so as I told you just to summarize the thing majority of the pancreatitis are called interstitial pancreatitis it is around 80 to 85 percent right so these patients have got only some swelling or edema of the pancreas they have a and they have a very transient or no organ failure and mortality risk is between 2 to 5 percent less than 2 percent some patients that develop necrosis this necrosis in the first two weeks can go to transient organ failure which we call moderately severe pancreatitis mortality risk is less than 5 percent some patients go for persistent organ failure mortality risk become 15 to 20 percent right now if this patient has got a sterile necrosis mortality risk is around 10 percent with this necrosis kabhi bhi infection nahi hota hai the mortality risk is around 10 percent but if these guys with necrosis persistent organ failure and mortality and the infection the mortality becomes more than 30 percent up to the tune of 60 percent so this is important to understand scoring system do you remember this some some of you will be asked in the exams but you should only remember the names it is extremely difficult extremely cumbersome extremely idiotic to remember these things except for the purpose of studies when you are doing some studies you need to remember this thing but uh, i think in clinical practice is difficult to remember these scoring systems and they are cumbersome and if you see the sensitivity and specificity is 
extremely poor. Whether you call it all these coding system, there is sensitivity less than 80% and the specificity also less than 80%. But name should be remembered for the purpose of exams. You should know that there is something called Ransom's code, you know, and Glasgow's code. But for the clinical practice, you need to understand who are at risk. Certain patient characteristics like elderly age group, if you call 55 years as elderly, 55 years if you call them elderly, when elderly age group, obesity of more than 30 kg per square meter, history of comorbidity, COAD, chronic liver disease, CKD, or patient with a heavy alcohol intake, they are at higher risk in clinical practice. Patient who have persistent SIRS criteria lasting for more than 48 hours at higher risk. Evidence of inflammatory markers, HS, HSCRP more than 150 milligram per deciliter, or certain IL-6, IL-8, or IL-10, which we do not measure. If they are also high, they are at higher risk. Certain laboratory findings like evidence of azotemia and hematocrit of more than 44, which lasts for more than 48 hours, even after fluid resuscitation. They are at higher risk. Certain radiology findings are also says higher risk. What is the fun of identifying these higher risk stations? Why do you want this? To decide where the patient can be treated, whether the patient will be treated in the wards, patient will be treated at home, or to be treated in the <coughs> intensive care unit. If the patients are in the severe pancreatitis by this criteria, then possibly we should treat this patient in the intensive care unit. Right? Three things are important. Um, uh, maybe you can practice in your clinical practice. They are available easily in the mobile app. You can do an Apache 2 score at admission and uh, daily for the next 48 hours or 72 hours to identify the severity of illness. CRP is easily available, not very costly also. If the CRP is more than 150 in any time in the next 48 hours, there is high risk of severity of illness. And persistent organ failure obviously is the classical diagnosis of severe pancreatitis. Now coming to the treatment. In the treatment, we'll be discussing four things. You know? First is the resuscitation. Second thing is the relief of pain. Third thing is the, necros the treatment of uh, nutrition. And fourth thing is the treatment of infection. Right? So let's come to the first thing, the resuscitation, fluid resuscitation. How much fluid? So to start with, you can start with a rate of 200 to 500 ml per hour. It is not sacrosanct. I am not suggesting that you should continue with the 200 to 500 ml per hour. I am just suggesting to start with, right? And you should definitely individualize the thing depending upon the clinical cardiopulmonary monitoring, depending upon the hourly urine output, fall in the hematocrit or fall in the bath, UL, right? Do not forget raised intra-abdominal pressure. Pancreatitis is a high risk condition for raised intra-abdominal pressure and abdominal compartment syndrome. Majority of the patients of ARDS, now the, uh, the things are getting very clear. Pehle pani do, give so much water, patient become flooded with pani and then you do an ECMO. Okay? So, please don't lend up in this type of things. So monitor the patient. ARDS is most, many of the ARDS are actually iatrogenic ARDS. There is something called global increased permeability syndrome. Pancreatitis is just like sepsis. So it has got an increased capillary permeability. So there is a, like lung is getting flooded, everything can get flooded, whether it is a brain or kidney or the other muscles and other organs, right? So this is called global increased permeability syndrome. To give fluid resuscitation, I'm not telling you keep the patient hypovolemic, but try to monitor the patient and remember these iatrogenic complications can occur and they do occur. Now, which fluid? Balanced fluid. No doubt about it. Balanced fluid, not normal saline. Normal saline up to 2 liter is not that harmful. But in usual cases of pancreatitis, you read around 2.5 to 4 liter to up to 6 liters in the first 24 hours. So give balanced solution. Which balanced solution? I prefer ringal lactate because it is much cheaper and it is easily available. And there is at least one study which has shown in a very small study of 40 patients which has shown that there is a significant decrease in the SIRS and CRP level 
where ringa lactate is compared with normal saline so it's okay to give ringa lactate okay and do it early there is no point resuscitating the patient beyond 24 hours if you resuscitate the patient beyond 24 hours uh, probably the sirs incidences and organ failure incidences are much higher what about pain relief pain relief is not only important for patients uh, comfort but is also important for improving the pulmonary function there has been proven doubt so just remember that there are certain drugs like morphine which can produce sphincter of body problem so uh, but i believe fentanyl is relatively better sometimes you have to use a combination of opioid and sid and acetaminophen i don't know how many of any one of you is using epidural analgesia for pancreatitis pain relief anyone great great that reduce the systemic opioids and probably will give very good it may improve the bowel motility and facilitate the enteral nutrition coming to the nutrition again it is important to understand if it is a mild pancreatitis as soon as patients pain relief pain is relieved not having nausea not having vomiting start oral feeding okay fat free oral feeding what about severe pancreatitis there are two school of thought one school of thought says that you put a rice tube and start the feeding within 24 hours but probably there is not much data available for that so i suggest no advantage of artificial tube feeding in less than 24 hours in those patients who are still continuing to have pain wait for 72 hours or having pain or vomiting at 72 hours start oral feeding as soon as the vomiting has settled if in the next two to three days the patient is still unable to take oral feed start enteral feed and amongst the enteral feed you have two options either you start ng feeding or nj feeding start with ng feeding nasogastric feeding if the patient is not tolerating ng feeding still having pain still having vomiting then you can try with the nj feeding sare modality fail ho gaya then start parenteral nutrition right let's recapitulate this is very important for practice and this is very important for exam mild pancreatitis what do you do let the pain settle no vomiting no nausea start oral feeding severe pancreatitis there are two options either you go for a forced feeding artificial feedings are forced feeding but there is not much data available so i believe you wait wait for 72 hours up to 72 hours if the patient settle, settles start with oral feeding try to continue with the oral feeding for next 2 to 3 days if the patient can't maintain start ng feeding if that fails start nj feeding if that also fails start parenteral nutrition and to prove that i have this wonderful study from dutch group multi center randomized control trial 208 patients of acute severe pancreatitis were randomized into two groups one group received nasoenteric feeding ng or nj feeding in the first 24 hours called the early group and another group received oral diet in next 72 wait for 72 hours and after that start the oral feeding <coughs> they had a primary endpoint of composite of uh, major infection plus death in the first 6 months of follow up and not surprisingly the result was there was no difference in the primary outcome between two groups so hamesha jaldi karna fayda nahi hota hai wait kar sakte hain 72 ghanta wait kar lete and very interesting thing is 70% of those patients who have started the oral feeding late delayed they could they, it was they, the investigators were successful to continue with the oral feeding so there is no need of force feeding remember the things that maybe nutrition is important but force feeding can be delayed for 72 hours so this is my mm -hmm. okay so just to make it the things easy for you do an early staging if it is a mild disease start oral feeding if the patient unfortunately becomes severe disease again or develops some complication then probably we can think of enteral nutrition if it is a severe disease think of enteral excess if there is enteral excess and there is more than 72 hours then you start the enteral feeding if there is intolerance to enteral feeding or there is no enteral excess continue with the parenteral nutrition <coughs> wait for ileus is getting ileus getting settled pancreatic inflammation getting settled no fistula 
this patient can be shifted to oral therapy. So this is just to simplify the things further. What about infection? Who starts? Uh, who does not start antibiotic on the day one? Uh, and are all of you are sure about it? Yes. All of you are in a closed ICU? Yes. You people are all working in a closed ICU? Not influenced by other doctors? Jhoot mat bolna hai. Sab start karte. But uh, for the purpose of exam at least, and actual real reason, remember that there is no role of antibiotics prophylactically. Okay? But infection do occur and pancreatitis patients are very high risk of uh, getting some infection. And incidence of infection peaks at 3 weeks. Remember up to 25% of the, uh, though it peaks at 3 weeks, but up to 25% of the patients infection starts between in the first one week as well. Always remember, it is bukhar agar aarai pancreatitis patient ko. It is not only because of pancreatic infection, it can be because of extra pancreatic infection also. You have a lot of lines and tubes. Remember them. Only indication for antibiotic prophylaxis is when you are going for an endoscopic sphincter open. Right? Antibiotics are associated with Clostridium difficile infection, propensity to develop MDR infection, and there is a threefold increase in systemic or pancreatic fungal infections. So be cautious in pancreas and try to, um, you know. Uh, convince your other colleagues to difficult so when do we suspect infection we suspect infection when the patients become unstable after the initial stabilization usually after 7 to 10 days or there is a recurrence of clinical signs shuru mein pancreatitis mein sirs hota hai fluid de diye sirs better ho gaya again sirs is developing and you should start thinking about infection how do you confirm the diagnosis if you get a ct scan like this Every time I told, every time patient deteriorates, get a CT scan, contrast it. If you get a CT scan like this, if you can see, there are some air pockets here. This is a, this is a tube. There are some air pockets here. If you see air bubbles in contrast city, within the necrotic pancreas, then it is diagnostic of infection. But how to confirm it? You confirm it only by CT or ultrasound guided FNA. I don't know how many of you are doing it, uh, but we should also send blood culture. Empiric therapy only for unstable patients, otherwise try to establish the diagnosis, at least for the, you know, uh, mm. is the last moment preparation. Scene. So what do you do with antibiotics? If there is a pancreatic necrosis and you suspect infection, patient is unstable or there is some gas bubble in the CT scan, Start empiric use of necrosis penetrating antibiotic. Why I am saying necrosis penetrating <coughs> antibiotics? Every antibiotic doesn't penetrate the pancreas. Okay? Imipenem. Imipenem is probably a very good drug which penetrates the pancreas very well. Cholestine probably doesn't penetrate the pancreas very well. But unfortunately, you have to use it. Sometimes. If the patient remains clinically uh, stable, you continue with the empirical antibiotic therapy. If the patient is stable or there is no gas bubble in the CT scan, obtain a CT guided FNSC. If the CT guided FNSC is negative and you still have high risk or high suspicion of infection, keep on doing the thing every 5 to 7 days. If the patient is, uh, the gram still is positive, start antibiotic. Now comes the role of source control. Okay, when do you do the source control? If the patient is clinically stable, do the source control means necrosectomy only after six weeks. If the patient is clinically unstable, do some percutaneous drainage or necrosectomy. What about endoscopic therapy? It has got a huge role in gallstone pancreatitis with evidence of cholangitis and evidence of polydocolithiasis. Um, there is some role of endoscopic ultrasonography for detecting that uh, polydocolithiasis. What is the role of surgery? Four role of surgery. If there is an infected pancreatic necrosis, try first with percutaneous drainage or minimally invasive techniques. Kabi kabi bahut ajib lagta hai na? Because hum to karte nahi hai kabi kabi. We don't do it. It's the surgeons or radiologists who do it. But aapko bolna padta hai kai bar. Do this and do that, you know, whether you do it or not. So do percutaneous drainage and minimally invasive techniques. 
if that is not feasible like my centers mostly we do the open necrosectomy open necrosectomy preferably to be delayed for four to six weeks if there is evidence of retroperitoneal hemorrhage again surgery is the only option if there is evidence of peritonitis surgery is the only option if there is evidence of abdominal compartment syndrome surgery is to be done right after the percutaneous technique has failed so there are four indications for surgery so this was a beautiful study again not related to much related to us which has cle clearly shown the initial step up approach means do the percutaneous drainage and followed by necrosectomy is better than open necrosectomy i told very clearly the biliary pancreatitis again it is important for the exams you know you have to remember this biliary pancreatitis are different different there is to be some urgent ERCP and sphincterotomy for cholangitis and obstructive jaundice. There is the role of percutaneous transhepatic gallbladder drainage if ERCP is not feasible. And cholecystectomy to be done before the patients get discharged from the, from the hospital. Right? Because there is a high risk of recurrence of pancreatitis if you do not perform the cholecystectomy. Okay, so these are the outcomes. Okay, so my take home message is it is important to diagnose very promptly, establish the severity as early as possible because it is closely related to the management of the patient, resuscitate the patient aggressively initially, look for complications of local and systemic complications, do not forget pain relief, give the nutrition judiciously. Always consider possible pancreatic and extra pancreatic infection or do not give antibiotic prophylactically. There is no role of prophylactic antibiotic at all except for endoscopic sphincterotomy. So I will be happy to take any questions if you have any.